I'm not going to give you a rest though, Tom, because we're coming to change direction, change direction ability. Would you be able to talk to us a little bit about the key key positions that we should be worried about when it comes to effective change direction? And then more importantly, how we train those. And just to give you a little bit of a caveat, we I spoke to Ian Jeffries recently. So the, the a few of the people who were in the kind of change direction slash agility space, I'm 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 I just know this will complement their stuff as well. So yeah, over to you. Okay. Uh what is change of direction? So there's a whole range of different uh definitions if we just talk about a change in path of travel or reinter orientation in terms of center of mass. Maybe I'll break down the change of directions. Typically we have four phases. There's probably some initial acceleration to initiate the movement or maybe some constant speed or constant linear motion. Depending on the angle, there will either be some preliminary deceleration, typically for our more aggressive change directions or anything kind of 45 or 60 degrees and above, depending on the sport specific situation. There'll be some preparatory postural adjustments, so some stride length adjustments, some preparatory positions to optimize our final foot plant, which we call our execution phase. So during prior to the execution phase, where there'll be that main foot contact, there will be some potential breaking over the penultimate foot contact and potentially prior steps. It is a multi-step action though, change of direction. So it isn't just the main execution foot contact. Uh, like I said, depending on the angle, that will dictate and your entry speed will dictate the amount of preliminary deceleration you do and whether that's necessary. You have your main execution foot contact and then you'll typically go and re-accelerate, continue visually scanning the field to go and perform your other technical actions. I suppose when it comes down to that main execution foot contact, there's probably maybe five or six different agility actions or change direction actions. So, so we've recently just, or about to release an agility, attack and agility paper where we've talked about the different range of kind of cutting and change direction actions. So we've got a typical sidestep cutting action, which involves a lateral foot plant. Where we're abducting at the hip, I want to push off towards the opposite direction. So that's probably our most common cut in action. Uh, they're all going to be biomechanically and potentially task dependent as well. And the optimal requirements are going to be dependent on the angle and the entry velocity as well. We have our crossover cut. So we get a medial foot placement of the same limb and we're going to push off towards the same direction. We can then do something known as kind of like a shuffle step or a, sh a shuttle step where we'll perform a series of lateral foot plants. So we kind of see that more from an evasive perspective. Our rugby players and our NFL players, they might perform one or two, three side steps and then perform a side step action. We then have a split step or a jump cut. So an athlete might jump actually into the cut and then push off that one limb or they may land bilaterally and then push off, off one limb towards the other direction. We then got a spin maneuver which is also evasive maneuver. So kind of like a blind side turn, typically of 270 degrees. Again, very popular in these kind of ball carrying sports to try and avoid being tackled. We then go into our more aggressive change of directions. So kind of something we call more of like a pivot or a turn, which goes into maybe typically turn to 120 de degrees or greater 110 degrees and greater. And that could be performed bilaterally or unilaterally as well. And then deceleration in its own right as its own agility action. I suppose in terms of technical models, our understanding is probably better for sidestep cutting. So we've got this inherent risk between performance and injury risk. And some of the technical characteristics that are required for faster performance could be at odds with potential increased knee joint loading. And Alistair was able to publish his dissertation on that. One of my thesis studies has highlighted that. Some, some good work by Catherine Havens and Aaron Fox as well discussing this potential performance injury trade-off. There's always going to be some inherent risk when we're changing direction. The main thing is just educating and for practitioners to know which technical characteristics are associated with faster performance, but just acknowledge there could be an increased risk of injury associated with that. I'll just focus on sidestep cutting. So <laughs> the faster we run, the greater the knee joint load. And so typically we need to reduce our momentum into that. So the penultimate foot contact is key. I believe, and my, uh, Alistair will probably attest to this as well, a lot of the poor postures adopted in that final co foot contact is a byproduct of suboptimal positioning on those preparatory steps, particularly in the penultimate foot contact. I think it's a really important step to put you in the optimal position to basically execute an optimal final foot contact. So we encourage this kind of earlier breaking 
a particularly sh sharper change of direction as well. It's kind of a safer strategy with a penultimate foot contact because we decelerate generally in the sagittal plane. Uh, the knee is kind of typically in a stronger position. The ground reaction force vector is aligned more in line with the knee joint center. And we go through substantially greater range of motion as well. Typically, it goes through about double the round of knee flexion around about 100 to 120 de degrees with a penultimate foot contact. If we think about the final foot contact, you're asking that one limb to go from a rapid breaking phase to a rapid transition into a propulsive phase. So asking it to do two things during ground contact, whereas that penultimate foot contact can purely focus on breaking. And it goes through increased range of motion, which is a safer strategy. So we try and encourage that. For a sharper turn though, we probably even encourage sort of like a 180 degree turn, maybe to decelerate more in the antepenultimate, start re-rotating re in the penultimate foot contact to start lining you up in the correct position. So potentially breaking earlier, but for sidestep cutting, you do seem to be in that sagittal plane. So break early, lower the center of mass. That's going to put you in an optimal position to create that perpendicular force with a wide lateral foot plant. We, we, need, we need that in order to change inertia and accelerate laterally or medially in this in this sense by having a wide lateral foot plant we need to acknowledge we're going to increase the moment arm in the frontal plane so that's going to increase knee valgus loading so there probably is this kind of goldilocks effect not too wide but not too narrow because we need to create that perpendicular force the key issue is i don't think a wide foot plant is necessarily that bad i think it's making sure you get high levels of pre-activation making sure the penultimate foot contact is important but not being in like an internally rotator or a knee valgus position and make sure we're landing in a kind of initially preflex position with a rapid transition to forceful triple extension. So I don't think there's any performance advantages with uh, dynamic knee valgus. We talked about the trunk earlier, so frontal plane trunk control is really important. Again, another performance injury risk trade-off. If your objective is to achieve the greatest exit velocity, we should be encouraging medial trunk lean. However, there is this argument that we need that <laughs> drop the shoulder, that deceitful trunk maneuver from an evasive perspective to fool the opponent it is a deceitful maneuver. However, we do get increased moment arm in the frontal plane, and that's going to again increase that knee valgus loading. So again, that kind of performance injury trade-off. Uh, from a performance aspect, is quite deceitful, and then you need that rapid trunk reversal to medial trunk lean. Again, if the objective is to complete the task as fast as possible, we try and rotate early towards the direction of travel. We've shown some stuff. Again, there's this trade-off with hip and knee flexion. If we want to reduce risk of injury, we just tell our athletes to run slow and land really softly. But it's just not going to be viable. It's not going to, we're not going to get the buy-in from the athletes. So there's a really interesting discussion point about the, I think it's the hip extension knee flexion uh, paradox. So what we found is our slower athletes display lower knee joint loads and they go through greater knee and hip flexion which probably makes sense, they're distributing the loading further up the chain. However, our faster athletes tend to, although they land in initial hip flexion or make ground contact at initial hip flexion, they don't go through any more hip flexion. So kind of maintaining the isometric and they go purely into hip extension. And I think, uh, is it Neil Welsh has shown some similar thing, resistant hip and knee flexion to be a strong performance indicator. But again, acknowledge the potentially increased, increased risk of knee joint loads as well. If we go down to foot positioning, we try and encourage a neutral foot position. Having excessively internally rotated will increase the susceptibility to, uh, again, knee abduction moments. Having excessively rotated outwards can lead to kind of pronation as well, which is going to lead to tibial rotation. So we probably try and encourage a neutral foot position. A big debate is whether we heel strike or not. Uh, I wouldn't want to change, although with a heel strike, we get larger impact ground reaction forces and some people advocate a forefront strategy. I wouldn't want to change direction just on the ball of my foot. I assume you're going to increase the load and the susceptibility to ankle injuries and we need that firm base of support. We need so that increased base of support will probably be safer from an ankle perspective. Uh, are there any other bits, Alistair? So, I don't know. So in terms of the optimal technical model, I don't think it exists, but we need to acknowledge the performance injury trade-off, try and address some of those technical deficits that are gonna, going to offer any performance advantages. So correct knee valgus, let's try and land with high levels of pre-activation, neutral foot posture, and try and optimize trunk positioning. From an evasive perspective though, you probably do need to drop the shoulder when you're sidestep cutting 
or can we start encouraging some more deceitful movements with the lower limb? Yeah, I think um, there's a, there's so many trade offs in, in all elements of sports science, isn't there? But I think you know, as Tom kind of said, you're not going to be telling your athletes to run slower. So I think you you can almost acknowledge that there are a few different cues that actually might be effective at kind of mitigating injury risk while also enhancing performance. So you can almost focus on on them aspects uh, with your cueing. Um, uh, we we use one which is just break break early or slam on the brakes, and that's that's conducive to both reducing the multiplanar knee joint loading during the final foot contact, and also making sure that the athletes are uh, it facilitates uh, an effective uh, reacceleration due to the reduced momentum going into the turn. So, you know, very simple cues have a lot of rationale behind them, and you can almost decide. Um, I know there's a there's a, probably a little bit more um, information on cues for acceleration and maximum velocity, but you can almost decide. And Tom's produced a few reviews on this. Um, decide which cues you want to use to elicit certain biomechanical uh, profiles or demands within your drills. Uh, but I think just underscoring it all is the fact that actually enhancing an athlete's physical capacity is probably the most effective way of um kind of mitigating or kind of giving a win-win approach for both performance and injury by you know being able to support them high knee joint loads during change of direction but also you know enhancing the strength and power qualities that are necessary for better performance so i think as long as you are um improving physical capacity alongside making sure that movement strategy is optimal or less poor then I think you, you kind of doing your job. So from a practical perspective, Alistair, looking at all the postural tweaks that Tom spoke about, how would you go about coaching that in an applied setting with your guys in the academy or in the first team? Yeah, um, I think it's very much dependent on uh, the, the athlete in question, the context. You know, if you're working with youth athletes, you've got to consider um, what stage of maturation they're in are they kind of um you know, going through heightened rates of growth um and that will kind of inform you know potentially what drills you're going to perform with them but also if you're working with uh, senior elite athletes are they on um are they returning to play are they you know just on that cusp of returning to actual training uh, and they've been working with the physios or are they in you know their high performance setting where you're almost trying to just maintain the qualities that they need to carry out week in week out? So I think you kind of need that in the back of your mind first and foremost to decide what are the training methodologies uh, that you're going to use. But I have typically kind of lent on using a kind of continuum that I know um, Matt Taberner likes to use a lot of the uh, control to chaos continuum, and I think that way you're exploiting both the pre-planned um, multi-directional speed or change direction manoeuvres uh, versus the more chaotic uh, reactive components that lead into uh, agility and agility training. So I would kind of typically start with these, if I was just to isolate it, not looking at how am I going to develop that long term in terms of you know the kind of different stages of learning uh, and, and all that kind of stuff. I think just from a, an isolated age, one-off athletic development session you kind of i'd always start it with pre-planned drills to begin with um maybe focusing in the warm-up as a bit more of a, a technical aspect you know we kind of use 50 to 75 percent of your perceived exercise intensity of as a kind of guide as, and kind of reinforcing them key postures that you're wanting if you're going into more of your cutting elements with uh you know, less sharp change direction requirements, less braking. You you kind of really focusing on um, getting them reactive qualities. So like you punch the ground away as you're um, kind of doing a zigzag uh, warm up drill, uh, making sure that the body is facing the dire intended direction of travel as well, and using them pre planned uh, change direction drills as a way of really hitting what you need to get in that in that specific drill so what i mean by that is making sure that they are executing a certain volume of 
left change directions to right change directions rather than within more of an agility based drill you kind of forsake that element of control because it does become more chaotic so with the pre-planned drills you, you can kind of target right i'm gonna get them doing the this number of accelerations over this distance i'm going to make sure that we get them performing you know two very sharp angle change directions at 135 degrees or you know a, a more shallow change direction at 45 degrees and making sure that each of them are kind of balanced and considered within your programming going forwards because then you can kind of determine right I did this amount of work on Tuesday this means that on Thursday I'm going to do this amount of work so I think there's always that pre-planned element which I would fall back on as a way of just making sure that you're getting the required dosage uh, which you can build on but then obviously the more contextual or reactive elements that you also need and are really important for in-game performance I'd almost segue that into the um, the technical training because I think most people will be doing these exercises as part of a, a warm-up so coaches just see a warm-up don't they whereas we we kind of would determine these as athletic development sessions and almost segue in, into a bit more reactive element where we are maybe, and this is also dependent on the stage as well, because you might not want to specialise with a bunch of under 12s. Whereas if you're, you know, doing a warm up for a, a under 23 player who is really wanting to hone in on their sport specific actions, you may be providing more of these contextual speed drills, which are, you know, position specific and use different actions that they will be typically performing in their uh, kind of position. So on that, you kind of you you are forsaking that element of control by um, kind of opening up the the decision making element, and you it's down to the athlete to to kind of decide what actions they're doing. And a good example of that, I remember having I think it was an under it was I was I was running an under fourteens um, speed session. And I decided that my training theme for today is going to be a bit more of the acute angle change directions, working on some maximum velocity elements, basically just reducing the deceleration loading that they're going to kind of uh, be exposed to in that drill, in, in that session. And I segued on to kind of an agility 1v1 scenario where I actually positioned the cones to a point where the athlete or, or the kid basically decided that I'm either going to evade my partner uh, evade my opponent and go to the left gate or evade my partner and go to the right gate and basically it's in you know the facing the gates and you, you're thinking right they're going to be getting they're going to be hitting some kind of change direction that is going to have no deceleration requirements whatsoever and that's how you kind of manipulate it through like the constraints however he decided that he's gonna to avoid to evade his opponent he slammed on the brakes, did a complete pivot, and then also did a backflip, and then managed to get, get past his opponent somehow and get to the, the gate that he wanted. But it just kind of shows that, as an example, as soon as you go to that more um, open-ended drill element, you do forsake that uh, element of control. So as much as it's, it's important, you, you also want to, to make sure that uh, they're kind of aligned as much as they can be to the specific themes or goals of that session so um yeah i think from going from control to chaos um with the ultimate kind of way you can structure your, your multi-directional speed um programs but at the same time within the context of that individual athlete so if i'm working with a, a player who's returning to play it might be a case that them more agility elements I want to forsake because I want to make sure that I'm getting a specific degree of loading or targeting a specific action that they have a deficit in. You know, you might want to overload the left limb versus the right limb. It depends on what the goal is. Whereas if you're working on a high performing athlete who is basically just needing a maintenance slash um, kind of a top up dose, uh, and then they're going to carry on with their typical uh, game week and training schedule, then it might be a case that, and they're a very good mover, it might be a case that you're focusing more on that um, K 
chaotic side where they are having to react to an opponent, pick up the kinematic cues and making it more sport specific, which is more conducive to performance. So yeah. Superb. So I'm going to dive into, move things on a little bit, but dive into the testing side. And this is something that's Surprise, it surprised me. It surprised me a little bit, I suppose, in the last probably year, when change direction and agility has been the topic of discussion. People have, and well, I say people, probably three or four, have said, no, 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 we don't do any change direction testing at all now. Used to. Moved away from it because we didn't get the information that we wanted or needed, and we've we've kind of moved away from it. So, coming back to you, Tom, and Alistair, feel free to jump in whenever um, whenever you feel appropriate. Testing in an applied setting. Okay. And just to caveat that, just to caveat that, I spoke, I spoke to Ian Jeffries again more recently. That was a thing, that was another theme of the discussion was the lack of change direction testing that was being done with how, how he was coaching coaches and also in his own practice. So, with all that said, is change direction testing losing its place in an applied setting, Tom DeSantos? I suppose it is, but I don't think it should be. I still think there's a time and place for it. Uh, obviously, I, I suppose it comes down to the needs analysis and the multi-directional demands of the sport. Most multi-directional demand sports will require agility. People, I don't know, pre-planned change direction testing and training seems to get bashed at the moment because they say, oh, it's not sport specific, it doesn't agility, it doesn't involve perception action, coupling. However, we test and train, or particularly train sprinting in a pre-planned environment. Everyone's okay addressing sprint mechanics in a pre-planned environment. (laughs) Everyone's okay addressing landing mechanics in a pre-planned environment. But as soon as we want to do a change direction drill, we immediately must throw a ball and a defender in, where most athletes probably don't warrant the right for it because they can't master the mechanics in a pre-planned. We don't go from our plyometric landing drills from a 50 centimeter box and thinking about an overhead target. We do it in a controlled manner. And I think that's why Alistair was highlighting it really well. We still want those pre-planned elements into it. We're not saying completely remove the unplanned element in terms of our training, but just think about the volumes and dosages and emphasize things at different densities. I suppose the issue is with change of direction is I, what I said to you earlier, we've got six, maybe five or six different change direction actions and the biomechanical demands and the, are all kind of task dependent, entry velocity dependent and angle dependent. I'd argue in most sports, our coaching philosophy is we want robust 360 degree athletes who are proficient at change direction off left and right limbs from low, medium and high velocities. If we start breaking it down into our tests, okay, we want our athletes to be able to sidestep at 45 degrees, 90 degrees, do some aggressive pivots. But then we need to make sure that you could be proficient on both left and right limbs. So from a kind of time and gate perspective, that means they need to do at least two trials on the left, two trials on the right at 45, 90s, 180 degrees, but that's five meters. So that shows that they're good at decelerating and change of direction from a low entry velocity. Do I now repeat the same thing at the high entry velocity? Before you know it, we probably need 30 change of direction trials to build up this multi-directional speed profile just for a a sidestep or lateral foot plant cut, cut in action. The issue is with the timing gates as well. We're getting to no insight into movement strategy. We're just getting an indication from how quickly to get from A to B, which is fine when the objective is in most sports to get from A to B, but we need to be getting a bit more insight into movement strategy, particularly how are they entering, how are they changing direction, and then how are they exiting. So again, with the advancements in wearable technologies and these non-invasive technologies, we are starting to get a bit more insight into it. But time and gates provide you limited information because we can mask our deficiencies and change of direction with superior acceleration and linear speed capabilities. But to counter that point, I'm a really big fan of building like this change direction angle profile. So I think if you want to know how well an athlete changed direction from a range of different entry speeds and angles, we need to build this profile. We do load velocity profiling with our jump squats, which takes 45 minutes, probably. Why can't we do the same thing on, on the pitch and actually view this testing session as an isolated training session to elicit some training stimulus? Because we all do multi-directional speed sessions, just view that testing session as a conditioning session as well to elicit that training stimulus. So I would probably want to build a picture of their 45 degree, maybe 90 degree, because 
the techniques required for 45 degrees slightly differ to 90 and a 90 degree cut is going to be completely different for a 180 but I do appreciate it will take some time but and that's only applicable for one isolated change of direction task with that and performing that side step cutting action in terms of agility assessments I don't think there will ever be a perfect agility assessment because sport is chaotic and again it will only be reflective of that specific entry velocity and that specific angle of change of direction I know there's been this big push on this 1v1 testing so we how successful are they evading opponent is there one hand touch is there a two hand touch I think it's quite flawed that approach personally because we're still not getting an insight to the perceptual cognitive speed and how do we standardize that defender for the attacker how do we standardize the starting position the, that attacker will eventually start getting used to that defender's position and then if we try to use, are we do we use the same defender across all tasks we're not standardizing there we can't use unplanned arrows or flashing lights or a non-generic or a generic stimulus because they don't differentiate skill level apart from formula one and maybe swimming, I can't think of any other sport where they might have to react to a flashing light or flashing arrow. And actually, you are increasing the potential uh, knee joint loading. So you do need that kind of sport-specific stimulus. I don't think we'll ever be able to fully do that in the pitch. In terms of monitoring it, though, I think we do need to be evaluating movement quality during a whole range of tasks. So not only just accept looking at the completion time, which is, is flawed, and even change of direction deficit is flawed, in my opinion. I'll come back to that in a second. Yes, yeah, so we'll come back to that, Tom. Uh, I think we should be <laughs> monitoring. We should be filming our athletes' technique during these range of tasks to see how they're executing them. It's particularly with our aggressive change directions. Are they adopting double foot contacting? Uh, are they predominantly loading one limb? What's their trunk position like? We can be doing that as a minimum, whether it's during a tested session or during our actual field-based conditioning sessions. There is, however... I know player maker are working on a change of direction angle. I think algorithm working on turning angle and change of direction time. I know Sportlight are using LiDAR technology, uh, which I'm currently doing a little bit of stuff with at the moment, looking at their products. So they're hoping they're looking at turning angle and change of direction time, which could be used for player tracking during match play. And then LEDs React as well are starting because the issues with radar we can start assessing instantaneous velocity i know we want to examine i suppose the issues with change of direction performance we can examine ground contact time but we can manipulate our ground contact time by performing a shallower change of direction and making the task easier we can examine exit velocity but again we can manipulate our strategy and just perform a shallow angle change of direction to get this inflated exit velocity so there's a whole range of things we need to consider when evaluating change direction ability which probably makes people shy away from evaluating change direction ability because it's very difficult to monitor exit velocity without a kind of radar device or 3d motion analysis i know some people have used a radar device for a 180 degree turn it's quite easy we can assess instantaneous velocity going in and out of the change direction but for our kind of more multi-planar movements like a 90 degree cut you'd need two I know, I think Hayder and Martin Boucher have done some work with that, but the reliability wasn't great. So I think this is where the wearable technology comes into it. And LEDs React have got a really good product at the moment. They haven't validated it just yet. But if it works, I think it could potentially revolutionize change direction testing because they're able to track the XY coordinates during tasks. So it isn't just limited to a linear task. It could just be more in our curve linear and change direction tasks. However, we need to factor in, ideally, the trajectory during this change of direction to see how they're performing that action because athletes can start rounding to manipulate and maintain speed. But that's what we kind of need to build that picture. Uh, should I talk about change of direction deficit? <laughs> we'll come back to that in a second. No Alistair, have you, have you got anything to add from a very much on-field applied perspective day-to-day -day when it comes to testing? Do you guys do any sort of change of direction testing? I'll get moved away from it. No, so um, at the at the first team, it's a bit different in terms of the testing situation. I think it's a lot more lab based. Uh, a lot of the strength and power testing, and it's almost done as part of the training session as well. So you, you can use your force platforms, horizontal hops and jumps. It's a variety of different athletic assessments that are just 
or form part of the the strength and power testing battery, which are also used to to kind of as a, a training session as well. So, in the same regard, I think that will be the way to go with the multi-directional speed testing and the change direction testing, because, like Tom said, if you're wanting to get an overall multi-directional speed profile, you're essentially going to have to to potentially do twenty different tests to to actually get what you want because not only do you want to evaluate change direction abilities you want to evaluate acceleration abilities maximum speed capabilities and you know curved sprinting capabilities so there's just so many different uh, maneuvers that require assessment in order for you to then target individualized training with so i think the way to go really is having these technologies in place that allow you to uh, perform testing in the field as part of your um, athletic development sessions and like Tom said with uh, Les React that's something that I think it can test up to four athletes at the same time and uh, I mean we're not we're not um, employees of Led React so we're not actually just trying to promote it or anything but essentially you can you can test four athletes at the same time within a standard standardized drill and that can almost inform part of each player's individualized multi-directional speed profile. And that can be collected not just in one session. You don't have to just go, right, this Tuesday we're going to do every single multi-directional speed uh, drill to get a profile. That can be collected longitudinally. Um, you know, the, the same way that we, we collect some force platform data. We might get them to do hops on the force platforms one week. Next week it might be, right, let's get some Nordics done for um, that specific element. So it's almost like as long as you can longitudinally track it, form part of a database, which you can then use to, to inform when players have maybe reduced their capabilities uh, or, you know, it, you almost want it to be a point where it's relative to an individual and their capabilities, but also relative to a squad, uh, an age group. Um, and then you're able to kind of produce... Um, standards from this as well for the different actions but they are being collected as part of the day-to-day -day practices so it's not a case of going right we want this this group of players or this team to do a testing session here and asking for time off the coaches it's a case of it's just ongoing every opportunity that you get to, to measure a certain quality as long as it's standardized then you are getting a almost um a dynamic or a there and then multi-directional speed profile that is getting updated each time you do uh, a drill. So I think, again, we're talking about technology that is in its infancy still. It still needs to be validated um, and it's it still needs to have the work done um, empirically before we, we'll all jump on and go, that is a technology that we want to use. But hopefully when it gets to that point, and we have these different technologies, uh, whether it's through radar, whether it's through um, IMUs. These are the kind of um, devices that are going to give us the insights that we want and need, but also um, give it us in appropriate time frames, which is also something that we want because I've had discussions with Tom before and I know what best practice is in terms of what I want to evaluate with certain players, but we just don't have the time. You just, you know, you're constantly having a battle between, if you're in an academy setting, it's not just a case of asking the football uh, coach for a certain time slot. You've also got the, the fact that these kids are coming in from school and they might be, you know, you have a training session dedicated for it and the, the school bus was late. So they come <laughs> half the squads yeah. not in for that testing session and then you've got to wait another six months. So it's a case of getting these... Um, it, it's, it's a case of testing without testing and doing it at a point where it's part of just the day-to-day -day, uh, training so sessions. That's where that in-situ profiling is going to, going to take off. So if we can get these kind of non-invasive technologies that can monitor and infer some of these physical qualities during training, whether it's over like a two-week period and we build up that kind of force velocity profile or that speed profile during ACT cells and D cells, I think that'll be easier. A change of direction is just a bit of a... It's just a hard task because it's just a multiplanar movement it's just so so much range there which makes it a bit more difficult to get find the perfect assessment which segues on lovely to change direction deficit tom uh yeah so just to, just to highlight i suppose with 
the reason why I'm still a big advocate of these pre-planned tests is because we're focusing on that perception action coupling. So agility involves the perceptual aspect and the action perspective. So what we're interested in is the mechanical ability to perform that task, irrespective if we add some externally directed attention or agility stimulus into it. If an athlete is poor at performing the action of that task, it's only going to be amplified and worsened in a not unplanned environment. And I, I still think a lot of athletes don't really excel at these pre-planned tasks. So we're evaluating the physical and mechanical ability to perform a change of direction, but we just got to appreciate that different angles. So the change of direction deficit, really popular in terms of assessment, really good way of perceive, uh, getting this isolated measure of change of direction ability. So essentially we take a change of direction test let's say 505 we take the time the total time put at 505 so the five in and five out with that 10 meter approach and then we subtract a, a sprint test of the equivalent distance and that can be applied for a 45 90 degree cut of the same distance we we've done that before so we're set, allegedly getting this isolated measure of change of direction ability but i suppose the issue is and there's a lot of research probably kind of showing it now it seems to be maybe potentially biased towards slower athletes Okay. So, so if you're a faster Perfect athlete, you're, you're actually at a disadvantage <laughs> potentially because let's just say if you've got, I don't know, do the 505 in 2.4 seconds and you sprint it in 1.8, you're going to have a change of direction deficit of 0.6. If you're slower, but achieve the same 505 time, you're arguably going to have a better change of direction deficit, but the athlete's slower. And it's, if you think about something with a 505, a faster athlete is actually at a disadvantage because they have a great horizontal momentum and they're going to have to apply a greater braking force, a greater braking impulse in order to decelerate and perform that task. So it's just something that we need to factor into with change direction deficit, the athlete's entry speed. One thing that we do need to do, and I don't think a lot of practitioners do, and I think Sophia Nymphius did highlight, is look at the pacing strategies adopted. For, I, know, I think most people go to a default 505. I kind of consider that more of a deceleration test now. But we need to factor in the approach or the 10 meter approach time. Immediately, if an athlete starts adopting a pacing strategy, the, the whole instruction is to complete that task as fast as possible. So they should be steaming in 100%. If they're maybe 5% slower, that means it tells me that they're not comfortable of decelerating with that five meter distance prior to the turn. I don't think a lot of practitioners are factoring that pacing strategy on whether they're standardizing it. So I think that's an important thing to consider. The, ch the change of extra deficit does appear to be biased towards these slower athletes. And I think what we do need to start going down uh, the avenue of even just from a kind of completion time perspective and I think Rich Clark has been discussing this and I've kind of potentially thought about manipulating it slightly is breaking down the change of direction into three components so entry time so the point at when they enter the change of direction to the point they initiate or the final foot contact so that could be our entry the change of direction time so initial contact to toe off of that main ground contact or execution phase and then the exit time so we're essentially breaking that completion time. I know it's not perfect, but we're getting a bit more into kind of that total time strategy. And then we can start identifying whether an athlete's entering in quickly and poor at re-accelerating or performing the change of direction poorly, or actually are they adopting a bit of a pacing strategy and entering in slowly to make it easier to perform the change of direction and then re-accelerating. Because at the moment, total time just gives us a very limited insight and I think we, at a minimum, we should be coupling that with some video footage. If we can get to a situation where an automated technology, such as a radar or a wearable device, can do that for us and start breaking it down into those three components, that would be great. But I believe you can sync certain timer gates to an opt to jump system. So you can get the time from when they break the trigger to the time of the onset of that ground contact to the final foot contact. We could break that as our entry change direction would be the ground contact time during the change of direction and then exit time could be end of that ground contact back when it re-accelerates through the time again just to build a better picture and couple that with some video video and i suppose the we've seen a lot of studies talk about momentum 
and saying, oh, athletes with greater momentum are at disadvantage, but they haven't directly assessed momentum during the change of direction task. They're just assuming that's the athlete's momentum during the specific change of direction task, which is erroneous because although a faster athlete that they're just taking a 10 meter sprint time, times it by the mass and saying faster athletes are poor at change of direction. We tend to see this kind of self-regulatory effect where actually these faster athletes potentially might adopt this kind of self-regulatory effect and don't want to utilize their full speed because of this break and load tolerance. And it seems to be the same with weaker athletes as well. We've probably all done the 505 and I see a lot of athletes start decelerating prior to the entry gate. So they want to decelerate over at least six, six meters or they're adopting this pacing strategy. So it's just something that we need to be aware of. Again, maybe one reason why some people don't like doing this change of direction, testing and applying this change I'd, of direction. I'd direction. written that point down about the self-regulation because Damien spoke about it on his podcast. Yeah. Um, and when, when, yeah, when really Seems to be like a physical, physical capacity yeah. issue. We've done some stuff with female footballers and we found eccentrically stronger athletes can approach faster and then decelerate quicker but then we know athletes who are quicker as well will probably will not want to fully utilize their speed potential to make the task easier but if you've got the speed you want to use it and that's why it probably comes down to optimizing deceleration and, and physical capacity so it's not probably not just as, as simple as having one test we need to factor in all these other different components when inferring change of direction ability yeah and i think just on that tom as well um like you were talking about this um, kind of uh, self-regulatory c- component, but a lot of the testing batteries now, if we're focusing on the traditional testing batteries, it's very much acceleration, linear speed biased. And you will get, if, you, if you're talking about actually profiling an athlete and, and kind of coming up with the standards of um, multi-directional speed ability, if you were to just use an isolated linear speed test, some athletes might come out as traditionally quick who are, you know, have good split times over five meters, 20 meters, 30 meters. But then it's, this is why it's important to also include these change direction tests or at least some indicator that um, reveals the horizontal deceleration capabilities coupled with potentially pivoting capabilities um, to make sure that, you know, if they're, whatever speeds up must slow down. So if we're getting to a point where these athletes have very high top end speed capabilities and we're going, right, that athlete's great, he's quick, um, move on, and then don't worry about the other elements that we've discussed, then we're potentially exposing these athletes to an increased susceptibility to injury risk through the higher movement speeds. So for us to kind of really understand where their multi-directional speed deficits lie, we need these um, other measures that are probably a bit less traditional um, and a bit more novel. And that will kind of give us these insights because the debate of whether it's a sport specific um, test versus uh, a physical capacity specific test, I would probably lean some more towards more of this physical capacity specific tests. So, you know, people might question, well, we don't really perform 505s. We don't perform... Uh, 180 degree turns in a game but in actual fact that's in covering a lot of the underpinning capabilities that are required for different um, change direction actions so it's about isolating uh, a physical quality that might be a strength or weakness of that athlete and then being able to go what in, what interventions in either a gym setting or a field-based setting can I apply to, to improve that quality which then will subsequently hopefully improve game related performance Superb. Thank you very much. <laughs> We've nearly gone two hours, which is which has flown, but thank you very much for giving me time. And I'm just going to round up there because I think I've robbed enough of your after both of your afternoons um to do this recording, but I, I do obviously appreciate it. Tom, I'm gonna come I'm Tom yes, gonna come right. to you. If people want to know more about you, your work, where's the best place to go? Uh probably best place in terms of the research would be research gate. Uh, mm-hmm. we try and upload all the copies in there or you can send a message directly so if you want to read the actual direct work uh, that would probably be the best place you can follow us on, on Twitter I need to remember the Twitter handle is it Tom DeSantos 91 <laughs> uh, but probably best off emailing I try to respond yeah. to all emails within a timely 
fashion unless they're my students i try to ignore them <laughs> uh, but yeah uh, t.dosantos at mmu.ac.uk and then generally kind of like science of multi-directional speed which myself alistair chris and paul all contribute to a bit more of the multi-directional speed related work onto there and what's the twitter handle for science of multi-directional speed Sci of multi-speed i believe that's what I believe that's what yeah at Sci of multi-speed um, I think we've got an Instagram we've got an Instagram account nice. set up now as well, so we're, we're trying to get a bit more posting done with that. Uh, and obviously the website, but you can access it through all the different links um, across the different social media platforms. I'm quite I'm very quiet on my own Twitter profile, but it's uh, I think it's AJ McBurney ninety six or something like that. But you can access it through. Um, the side multi speed account anyway so superb well thank you very much like i said thank you very much for giving up two hours and more probably after we got going um uh, yeah thank you very much for giving up your afternoon and um some great content really appreciate it and we'll chat soon cheers rob cheers rob cheers fun. guys <laughs>